Welcome back to another episode of The Political Life. Today, we are going to have one of our more unique episodes um, because we are going to have a... We're having Josh Gray back on. Uh, so Josh Gray, this will be um, many firsts that we'll, we'll have today. Um, he's the first guest that we've had on three times. We've had a... Um, besides kind of the regular Washington... Um, quick updates. But uh, so Josh, this will be his third time back on the podcast. And today we have his mom, which you, if you've listened to the, the past episodes with Josh, uh, his mom came up several times, Jackie Kretzman, um, who is a journalist and entrepreneur and very, um, uh, very thoughtful and uh, interesting guest that we're going to have on today. We have Josh's mom on with us. And the three of us are going to have a conversation, and um, I couldn't be more excited and slightly nervous uh, because um, I don't know. We this we're, we are we are venturing into new ground. So first of all, Jackie, welcome to the show. Thank you, and you don't have to be nervous because unlike Josh, I am not going to swear. Well, it's not the swearing I mind. It's that uh, I, I have two very smart people, and if I if I mess up, I know I'm going to be corrected on the air. And uh, and I know the editors. I have noticed that the editors, when they edit, they make the guests. They never edit my mistakes. They always make the guests look great. But if I say something silly, they always go. leave it in. So. But all right, so everyone is familiar uh, with Josh and his background, and, um, and 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 if you haven't listened to him, uh, there's two episodes. They'll be in the show notes. You should go back and listen to him. And so uh, tonight, today, I thought we would start with um, Jackie. Uh, so Jackie, let's uh, before we get into your life or whatever, why don't you tell us first how you came to meet uh, Josh? Sure. Um- it was 1993, and I was at the time a sports writer um, for a newspaper in the San Francisco Bay Area, where I um, still live, covering um, the NBA and to, and also Major League Baseball, and also for um, the magazine The Sporting News, I was covering the NBA. And I was volunteering for a um, in Berkeley, the city I um, lived in. Um, it was a city-run program called the Berkeley Young Adult Project, and um, for at the term at the time was at-risk kids, and um, I was there to help them reading and writing English skills. Josh was in my group of maybe half dozen um, sixth graders, um, and he and I bonded immediately. I think a because Josh is eminently bondable because he's you know an engaging guy, but you know at that point as an eleven year old he thought he was giving the next Michael Jordan right as half the eleven year old boys in America did at the time, um, and so you know um, he glommed on to the MBA's writer in the in, in the group, but um, but you know we really hit off a natural connection. But it, it began with that, so it began with um, tutoring, and I used. Um, his passion for sports as a kind of carrot to get him interested in writing and, and to write and so forth. And I'm going to, um, if there's time, mention a nonprofit I'm involved with that does just that nation uh, nationwide in a few minutes. Um, and um, so it kind of went from um, tutoring twice a week, once or twice a week, whatever it was, to then more of a mentoring relationship where we got for ice cream and then we started having breakfast on a regular basis on uh, getting my husband or my then um um, boyfriend, who soon will be married a couple years later, um, Larry, um, who, you, who Josh talked about a lot last time, um, Josh's dad, getting you know him involved in the relationship of Josh, um, and then over time it just grew and grew and grew um, until he moved in with us, as he talked about in high school, and at some point it went from you know us being Jackie and Larry to mom and dad, and I, I would say that's roughly high schoolish um, when when that kind of evolution, that, and it was so it was basically an organic developing relationship um, starting in um, starting then in sixth grade. And so when you began tutoring, so you were tutoring sixth graders and um, um, how many years did you do that or how many years have you done that? Oh, not long. I, that was the first time. And, um, and um, so I did it that year. 
Um, and then the next year, I, I started a program at the same organization, bringing in speakers of color to talk to, because the students were basically um, all BIPOC, to teach them about, um, um, or to bring in the African-American and Latina, Latino um, um, professionals. They could have been lawyers or doctors or architects or chefs. So the kids could see, hey, there's people who look like me are doing all these great careers. So the next year, I did that instead of tutoring. And so, and you being that involved, um, getting more and more involved in Josh's life, was that a common experience uh, for the volunteers, um, or was that somewhat unique and unique because of Josh's uh, willingness and uh, eagerness to learn? I believe the latter, I man. You know, I can't speak for the other volunteers. You know. Um, but for example, as the relationship grew, um, you know, Josh was on his middle school, his junior high basketball team in seventh and eighth grade. He was this, one of the two, two or three stars of the team. And so there was a coach who, who was a law student, Berkeley, um, and Mike, and he it was the coach, but I, I was the assistant coach, and which because A, I knew basketball, but mainly because I was willing to drive carpool to the away games. <laughs> So, um, but you know, so I was involved in uh, about practices and games for his seventh and eighth grade year. So getting to know the other kids on the team, but you know, there was this guy, Mike, who volunteered. So I don't, it's not an unusual thing for, you know, people to volunteer in the community you, with, about something they love. You know, and what do you kids. remember about Josh, your first impression of him? Oh, good question. Um, you know, I didn't know anything about him. I mean, I didn't know that he was in foster care or anything like that at the time. He was, um, but um, just that he was um, so willing to learn. You could tell there was something special about him. There was other kids in that class, and they were, um, I'm sure they were. There was others who were interested in the basketball connection mm -hmm. I had, um, but they weren't Josh. You know, they weren't. They didn't have this special um, spark. To them, so um, so he was he you know even though he was we were unfamiliar of each other's background and culture and maybe we'll get into that today, we just um, somehow were two individuals who liked each other and you know it was pretty simple as that. And let's um, and tell going. us about the organization that you you mentioned you wanted to uh, talk about. Oh, so I recently became involved. There's a it's actually based in New Jersey. There's a nonprofit in New Jersey called Right on Sports. W R I T E. And it um, use, leverages kids' passion for sports, middle school students, um, to increase their literacy skills. So right on sports is in about a dozen school districts, um, largely New, New Jersey and Rhode Island. In the, um, they work with um, school districts and they're part of their summer school program. And they have a curriculum developed for students to improve their writing skills using their um, using sports. They actually could podcast and make videos as well. And they bring in professional and college athletes and journalists, take them to a sporting event. So I am launching a chapter, their first Bay Area chapter this summer um, in the Berkeley Unified School District. So I've become, so it's kind of full circle for me. 30 years after I met Josh, um, you know, I've been involved of another nonprofit for a long time that worked with um, maybe a similar cohort, but this, but I'm no longer doing that. So I wanted to to get involved again, found this just by chance, and it's a great organization. So right on sports.org, everybody. Check All right, it out. We will put it in the show notes. Josh, what was your right. first impression of Jackie? Um, I mean, I thought she was cool. I mean, that was it. I mean, it was me and four of my other friends, right? So you you think of like, oh, this one. Well, really why did cool you think she I mean, how, sure. you really thought she was cool or was it was cool because what she did for her work? I mean, here's it was cool because what she did. Okay. Yeah, all right, I'm just. All right. I'm yeah, be be this was come on, this white woman coming to this white room. No, she was because she like give us a little. Oh, we yeah, did this for Stanford, and she brings a little footballs, and she will you know bring these things. And so for us, this is like great, you know, like this woman can talk sports. You know, this woman like will bring NBA stars to so, like after school. Like, of course, we love this woman. Like, this was great. I mean, all my friends who I grew up with this to this day will ask about Jackie because you know. <clears throat> Jackie was a cool one who, in the only white person at an after school program who came in to tutor us, who loved basketball the way we did. I think, you know, my mom made a great point, not just myself, for any kid who grew up poor in neighbors of like West Oakland, South Berkeley, or any kid across the country, you knew about colleges because of basketball. You know, you're inspired by basketball. You know, what it, what it took, you didn't know 
what, what like what did you need to do academically to get to that point of the MBA or to college? But you knew about college because you loved Alan Iverson, you love these things. And so here you have this woman who like, oh, Cal Berkeley, oh, this. I'm like, oh, great. She's cool because, you know, she knows sports and she gave us things. Um, and at that point, you were living in foster care? Yeah. I mean, I my, I, I, um, I moved, my, I have an older sister I mentioned who's a year older, and then six years later, uh, my, my biological mother had a younger sister and uh, another, excuse me, had a daughter, and uh, we were taken away from her, uh, my my mother, my biological mother, when I was six and my sister was seven, and we moved to a foster care home. And then about uh, two months later, uh, we were, grandmother became our foster care parent. So we we're still in the system, which is that our biological grandmother. And how old in. were you? So how old were you when you went into foster care? Uh, six, six and going on seven. Wow. Okay. Um, and, and, and that lasted until the whole story of being illegally cut off of foster care. And I was 18. I was two months into high school. I mean, two months into my senior year of high school. Okay. Tell us about um, uh, both of you, really, Josh and Jackie. Did you, uh, as this relationship uh, uh, continued on and got closer and closer, and uh, eventually, you know, you uh, down the road moved in with Jackie and Larry, um, did you have any preconceived notions um, that were changed or shattered um, as this relationship developed? Is that from Ma? Ma? Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, you know, and thinking about it, you know, I had, um, I was 30 at the time. I had 30 years of preconceived notions to shed. Josh only had 11 years of preconceived notions to shed. <laughs> so true. I probably had a lot more. Um, <laughs> Yeah, you know, I grew up in a, um, you know, quote unquote, liberal Jewish household in a suburb of Cleveland. And, and you know, and I was raised on this story um, of blacks and Jews. And, you know, we Jews were part of the civil rights movement, working with the blacks for when Mar marching of Martin Luther King. And, you know, there was definitely some truth in that. I mean, a lot of truth in that. But that was kind of the, um, you know, the positive story that I was um, raised on. And, and, um, and I didn't realize that, you know, beneath that positive story, that's, you know, as idealistic as that was, as Jews are, you know, the story being Jews were the generation before blacks, not before the blacks of the 60s, not before blacks in America, of course, we were um, immigrants who were discriminated against. So we know discrimination, you know, so we have an alliance and, you know, but not but of course, it's not the same, you know, anywhere near the same whatsoever. I mean, my parents and grandparents had a lot of anti-Semitism they experienced growing up, but I never did. And so, um, and but there is definitely race. In, in looking back, a lot of racism in my family. Even you know, um, I, you know ja uh, uh, uncle who would you know use horrible language and um, and only say negative things, and you know, and um, just um, you know, there was just it was you know okay to you know it was it's okay to um to be supportive of african americans and so forth but you better not marry one you know that that which is i'm sure, sadly still um still an attitude today that's not like that's gone away but it was um you know there was limits to this liberal um a pro um viewing of and i we didn't know any blacks we lived in a, our our neighborhood was nine was 95 percent jewish um you know the most um jewish neighbor in the united states to this day or at least before um before the rise of these ortho ultra orthodox um cities in the new york state but um you know we had a gardener who came twice a year it was an older black man named jackson and he started calling me Jackson because my name is Jackie, and I would bring him lemonade. And everybody thought that was the cutest thing. And my parents would try out this story to show they weren't racist, right? You know, so that was um, cr crazy now when you look at that. And when you say the most Jewish neighborhood, you're talking about in Berkeley, not Ohio? No, this is a suburb of Ohio, um, Cleveland, Ohio, called Beechwood. And the, uh, my public oh. high school was 95% Jewish. Um, so, wow, incredible. Yeah. Okay. Right. And um, it's not like so that. Was, it yeah. Was. Um, and so uh, there was a difference between, you know, um, 
in theory, and then here you are kind of in practice, um, um, uh, it was a little bit different. Oh, yeah. So I met Josh and then I started meeting his family. And that was really just as uncomfortable. I'm sure it was uncomfortable on both sides, but I didn't know um, it was uncomfortable for me. Um, you know, meeting his family and I was eager to and glad to. And it was and I learned so much, not just from Josh, but from his grandma in particular um, over the years. But um, it was a new experience for me to walk into a house, a, some you know, a black family's home. I've never done that before, before I met Josh. And Josh, how about you? You know, my grandmother grew up in Bay City, Texas, you know, um, and so I think, you know, I, I don't know how much of my grandmother was, you know, anti-white. I mean, for us, you know, you grew up, we were from West Oakland, South Berkeley, you grew up from West Oakland, you just, you're the only person you will see who's white is probably your teacher. You grew up in South Berkeley, which is, one would think of Berkeley being extremely liberal, uh, in which, it, you know, it's liberal to an extent. Um, you often, you're only the only people you play with on a, you know, you'll, you in your neighborhood, they're black. The playground, black and white, your know, teachers is that. So you go back and your every day of like living in your neighborhood, they don't look like you. And so with my grandmother who, you know, who had an eighth grade education, her interactions with white people were very, very limited. It, it was really, you know, if you're going to, you know, the grocery store, if she's going to uh, figure out some social security or something, some type of agency, that was really for her, her extent of interacting with a white person. And so, um, but with that, or, or even we had a, had a great social worker who came to the house once a month, who was amazing, named Norman. Great. That was it for her. And so this is, was really new for her. But then also for me, who's someone who's not in that capacity as a teacher. Um, but there was never, because, you know, preconceived notion of whiteness of this or white before bad. It was never that. It was just more of an, uh, just an adjustment. And um, uh, and so the, the tutoring and the mentoring continued from sixth grade all the way through high school. And then at, at senior year in high school, Josh, you moved in. Um, with Jackie and Larry, is that right? Yeah, I, I you know, I, I think about was at what point if this of like the, or I should say the genesis of us getting to that point of me calling Jackie my mother was probably in ninth grade. You know, I think about this one day I was kind of crying in the car and understanding that, you know, if I had my biological mother and I mentioned this kind of when I had a father who was never around and then had a mother who loved me, but was never around. And so when you deal with that, you deal with abandoning issues. But then I was so open to feeling love and wanting love because I didn't feel like I had love at home. And so when meeting my, when Jackie, my mom, you know, it, it's often when kids go through the system, um, they feel lost and not loved, even with family. And so the trajectory as we know statistically, they either will be homeless, they either go to jail, they either die within the peers from, from the teenage years to 21. But I was so open and feeling sometimes you meet people with so much anger, but I was so open for love. And so meeting my mother was so open for that because I wanted that because I didn't have that at home. Even though my grandmother, my father might have loved me, might have loved me, but I didn't feel that, they didn't show that. But here I had a woman for years that my first time ever on a on, on a plane with, was when she took me to my first football game at USC to see Keyshawn Johnson, my first ever trip to go to Disneyland. You know, I grew up poor. We didn't have those opportunities. And so having that six days out of the week growing up poor, one day out of the week in a, in a white family, my father, uh, Christian from, from New England, my mother is a white Jewish woman from from the Midwest and having these experiences has really opened me up. And then like, I want to accept this as love, no matter what she looked like, no matter what her background, here it is as a woman and a man that loves me for who I am. And then coupled with my mother's family, well, I my uncle Marty and his wife really accepting me as their own. And so when you have that, when you feel like you don't have any, this is like, I want you. And so I remember like yesterday crying and asking my mother to take me away from my grandmother because I didn't have that support. I didn't have that love. I felt like no matter what I did, I did what's wrong. Um, did not have the support as if when my older sister, what, what she had. 
Um, and so that was really the first time, I think, in that point of the first time of really calling her my mom and crying and want her to then take me away from my grandmother. Which I didn't, which I didn't do, which we didn't do at that point, ninth grade. Um, you know, my, our thinking, my thinking then was he should stay, you know, he was with families, with his sisters and, and his grandma and, I, and his grandmother did the best she could under the circumstances. She could have done better. It was, you know, she was dealt a, a hard hand in life in general, but also raising her grandchildren. Right. So, um, and so it, we also, um, didn't, and I, I made a point of taking her, when he had a disagreement with Mildred, his grandma, I would often almost always take her side um, because I wa I didn't want her to prevent Josh and I from seeing each other. I didn't want her to see us as a threat trying to take him out of the family home. Um, so we resisted, and not because we didn't love Josh. I, you know, By this point, ninth grade, we were spending weekends with him and, you know, taking him as we had up some property in Northern California, taking him and his friends up there. I mean, he was integrated into our life fully, you know, at that point. Um, but we, and, and also part of it, and, and Josh could talk more about this, she was very involved in the church. Um, and, you know, we were a family of atheists over here. <laughs> and um, No, my dad is not an atheist. My, gosh, <laughs> my, my mother but, uh, is an atheist. <laughs> my dad you know, is not atheist. But not observant religiously, let's put it that way. Yes. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I know it was really important to her that Josh um, stay involved with the church. And, um, and in fact, one of the conditions she gave when he did move in with us was that she, he would continue going to, with him, the, with the family of the church, I think it was Wednesday nights and some Sunday mornings and then some other times when, you know, here and there Bible study or whatnot. Um, I, didn't so, even, I didn't even know that because I didn't even know. I just, I didn't yeah, know you had spoken with Mildred about that condition. Well, I, but also it was like no choice of condition because basically I had no other place to, <laughs> to move to. So, yeah. you know, yeah. you think about it, but I never knew that. So there you go. Yeah. Uh, jo uh, Josh, you had been through, uh, a fair amount of trauma at that point. And do you think you reaching out and wanting, um, needing this love from Jackie and Larry, was that different than other kids? Or do you think any other kids in that situation would have been doing the same thing? Yeah, I, you know, I don't know. I think about a lot of my friends in that situation and but also having, you know, uh, you know, I think granted my personality of that, when you go through so much trauma, you, you feel hurt. And you don't know how to open up and you don't know but you, how, but you but did, I think is part of me doing so. It's just being this figurious kid of saying, okay, I'm just funny. I'm going to be out there. I mean, not intentionally, you know, 11 years old, you're like, I'm so different, but I think just being myself and personality and having a family who's like open, like this kid is different, um, helped me. You know, I don't know how much of my friends who I still to this day, some talk to, would say, yeah, they, they could have done the same thing. You know, my mom, we actually, um, my mom had tutor another young lady from there and things didn't work out the way it worked out for us. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think about, I think about how fortunate I am through my personality, but then also how walking into a space, and I mentioned earlier where, you know, un the unknown, we, you know, you hear these kind of these sayings now in this space in the past five years. It's about DNI and workspaces, and we talk about acceptance. It's about, you know, we think that you have to, in order to be comfortable, you have to be uncomfortable. And I, think, I, I hear that often. And as a young kid at 11 and 12, I always think I didn't have that opportunity to get to, to be uncomfortable. I just immediately walked into to, to have to be comfortable in this space. And I think, Mom, if you want to jump into that because of yeah. being young and being black, my mom just sent me a photo of us like being young, being black. And I mentioned this to Jim, was so how do how I learned how to try to, to put sentences together, to speak to a certain way, because I'm around a group of people, particular white people who are educated to teach me and I have no time to become, so I can move into many different circles now because of my upbringing. Yeah, I mean, Josh was exceptionally open. Um, you know, we talk about, you know, you talk trash about trauma and we all know about nature, the nature nurture argument. And there were, you know, and there's, but you, I don't, not you didn't, in a way you transcended your nurture, your 
upbringing with your nature, your Gregorious nature, your open nature. You were, you know, no matter all the traumas and the obstacles you overcame, you, the, you know, Josh Gray kept shining through all that. You know, that was you. And, um, um, and so but that was also, but that was, you, that was, you, you know, I think, yes, but that was also you, I'm here because in you and dad, right? I mean, I think, you know, and I get what you're saying, but I, and not, not refuting that, you know, I think part of this too, mom, is that survival, you got to do it. But, you know, a part of half that foundation of who I am was because of you and dad, that doesn't take away how I showed up. But if I didn't feel this comfort of openness and family without saying, this is my son, yeah. without feeling before us knowing that eventually that will become that. Yeah, and, and I understand that. I agree. I mean, it was a totally a two-way street. We, um, you know, we gave, we got from Josh just as much. And, um, I, you know, I learned a ton. And, um, but yes, we exposed to Josh to things he would not have been exposed to. You know, different people, different experience. I took him to his first jazz concert, Joshua Redmond, for example. You know, and we kept doing the museums and, and jazz, a little bit of classical music. But, you know, that he mainly developed on his own later years. No, but, no, no, dad, dad. Because when dad yeah, cooked, it wasn't classical my, my, music. My, yeah, my husband was, my, um, yes, through, through, my husband was very much and still is in the classical music. That he did, he introduced Josh to that. But, you know, we exposed him to things that were just, we were exposed to as kids and teenagers. We took as a matter of course, that's, you know, just learning about the world. Um, and so, you know, you know, we, we obviously, you know, we, we just went with our instincts because we, you know, and which is good. We didn't, wasn't like we following some kind of playbook of how you raise a, you know, raise a kid from a different culture. We just did what just seemed natural at the time, which was, you know, giving them as much, you know, we didn't have a 529 college plan saved up for Josh, you know, so there wasn't like that, you know, and we'll get into his college, you know, in, in a minute, I, I'd like to talk about, about that, but, um, you know, it was just going on instinct and love, you know, and um, I was also enjoying, you know, the hell out of it, just getting to know Josh and different experiences I had he, through his family or the basketball team, his middle school, ba you know, basketball team. So I was learning every day from Josh, just like he was learning from us. And maybe it wasn't these, you know, at my age, I wasn't, the things I was learning were different than what he was learning. Do, you know, one big quick question, Jim, to Jackie, you know, at what point, we've talked about this, but I guess I want to ask, you know, as now you've been such a huge part of my life, at what point are you thinking about George Floyd, you think about, you know, racism, you think about uh, racial profiling? Did you ever think when I got my driver's license, oh, shit, I got a black son now? Like, at what point you can then realize as a white woman, or have you identified yeah. the issues of what black women may go through having a son? Also, we would love for you to share the story on when I used to get pulled over a lot with four deep in a Honda Civic with my friends. So yes, you know, we, um, my husband Larry taught Josh how to drive. Um, um, in the I think the 1995 Nissan Sentra I had at the time, and um, and we had to put a in in the glove compartment of the car. You know, um, we put a note saying to whom it may concern, Josh has permission to drive our. You know, Josh Gray has permission to drive our car. Um, cause it was registered to someone else. He was pulled over, you know, a number of times driving while black just for nothing. Um, and so, you know, that never would have occurred to me. And he, I mean, it was at his instigation. He's the one who suggested we put the letter in the glove compartment cause he knew this, um, he knew this was going to happen or maybe after the first time it happened, it was going to continue happening. But Josh, you were, you know, you, put yourself out there and were open to what Jackie was offering. And, um, you know, as Jackie indicated earlier, you, you know, what was more important, you being eager and willing and open to uh, uh, exploring this and, and working with her, or the fact that, you know, she's this incredible woman who was showing up every week doing this uh, and giving you incredible opportunities. As I hear your story, I think Jackie's incredible but I, I have to say, I think that you putting yourself out there was kind of the first step and the and the harder step, quite frankly. Um, if you have no, I mean, yeah, right. Yeah, and and I'm and I and whether that was your your DNA or your upbringing mm -hmm. or your grandmother, you know, uh, Mildred. Um, uh, but as you tell your story and as you kind of open mm -hmm. up to uh, 
uh, reaching out to her, I, I don't know, it just seems incredibly uh, brave to me, uh, the fact that you were willing to do that. My dad will listen to this podcast and go, gosh, my son sounds really humble, knowing that I'm really kind of... <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, she's completely full of shit. Right, right. This is, this is exactly what my dad. We got, we got Jackie to swear. Yes. yes. We're yes. not editing that out, Jackie. Yeah, That's staying in. Right, 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 right. My dad and my mom will probably say, God, our son sounds so fucking humble. Uh, um, you're right. But I, I, yes, right? It takes that. Also, so I just want, I mean, you I. We don't have, and, and, have nothing else, too, though, right? It's, yeah, yeah. And I just look at it. just hope they want that. But I think when you, you know, Statistically, when I was held back in first grade, and this is facts, California, right? When I was held back in first grade, they made a prison bed for me in the state penitentiary, right? In the state, they did that in the state prison. We've seen that statistically. A kid who's black who's held back, we know statistically, he or she has a higher percentage of going to prison by like, by 18. Then at that point, then now I'm in remedial courses that they put me in from seventh to eighth grade, moving to ninth grade. That kid then statistically, he or she's barely graduating from high school, let alone projected then go to either property. Coupled with now, I'm a foster care kid. We've seen from statistically where foster care kids go trending, whether it's homelessness, no health care, right? Which I did not have when I was a senior high school. Got in a car accident. My parents wrote a letter saying, when his parents, but not his parents, no health care. And also understanding the track of poverty couple within maybe junior college in a minimal wage job. I mean, that is what it's still to this day, right? And having to be, how many of my friends grew up where my, my, my sister's cousin, my family, mother grew up, mother had a, a drug overdose without having a mother. You know, I grew up where I have a best friend has been missing for 20 years. My other best friend, cousin, like I, I, I've seen so much Right. But then part what saved me is having someone in family who believed in me to say, oh, we can get you out of this. So let me ask, because um, I know our listeners are going to be thinking this. First of all, when 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 Josh says his mother and father, he's referring to Jackie and Larry, um, your biological mother and father and Mildred. Um, um, can you tell us anything about them today? Where they are today? Do you do you? Do you, oh, do, do you know yeah, or? I do. So my, you know, my relationship probably stopped with my biological mother when I was 11, when I met Jackie. But okay. uh, I, she was always around, in and out, from homelessness. She, she dealt with drugs. She passed away in 2015. My biological father actually is still alive. My sister, I have five sisters on my father's side. They're still in co contact with him. Um I um I never had a desire. Um I had a father, right? Mm -hmm. And my father could teach me or he he's taught me 50, 60, 60 I say 50, 75% what it is to be a man. I found that other 25 from uh kind of like a grandfather who passed away named Ardry. I have kind of like a godfather named um William Bill called me Uncle Bill. Because my father at the end of the day, I had a father, so I didn't need what my sister needed, which was a father, she she felt lost without that, and, and that's not enough, you know. I think we can all deal with maybe father issues or mean that that need to have a mother and father, and she rekindled her relationship with her biological mother. But for me, I didn't see a race, you know. It's, we often will hear stories like, "Oh, Jack and Larry is white savior." No, like I did not see a race, and my parents didn't see a race. What I saw was a mother and a father. I saw a family who loved me. I saw a family who welcomed me with open arms for who all, all of who I am. And then you said Larry taught you what what Larry taught you 50 things about being what was that? Well, well I always say no I was saying you know my dad you know we always say you all you know you mean as a black man you need a black father to raise you. Um because he, he can talk to you about the challenges of being a black man in America. My father just laid the foundation of who I am today. But I have to go and search for God. that somewhere else. My mother is my mother. My mother has, and my mother, you know, and to be honest, can, has operated sometimes through a white privilege as a mother because she's like, oh, sometimes they're forgetting. Oh, shit, I got a whole, Josh Gray is a basic white boy name, as we all always joke and say. But for remembering it, you have a whole black son. My, my mother can protect me. I had benefited from white privilege in understanding that. But you also need to figure out who's black, who's a black male who can help you as a black man 
and I seek for that. Got it. Got it. Understood. Okay. At some point, um, we should talk um, about post uh, George Floyd um, and 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 the New World Order uh, and that that whole um, event. Uh, what has what did that mean to you all, and what has changed since then? Obviously, a lot has changed in the country. You know, it made me, as it did many, many people, or at least it should have, and I think it did, aware of my white privilege, things I just took for granted. Um, um, And it, um, but even beyond that, you know, something Josh helped me with, an example, I was on the board of a nonprofit in Berkeley, Berkeley Community Scholars, that gave um, scholarships and dedicated mentoring to um, Berkeley High high school grads, they're pretty much all kids of color, who were accepted in the four-year colleges. There was about 100 kids in the program. I was on the board. I was mentoring someone when all this happened. Um, and and then over time, you know, um, the staff and the board of the organization, the staff who was mainly um, staff of color, and the board, which was increasingly coming as it should be uh, more, um, staff, um, more people of color on the board, um, started objecting to some of the, um, kind of the business as usual practices of the organization. And a, a really good example, we'd have, um, an annual gala and, and this is a classic case of, um, you know, um, white savior complex, I think, is that at, at our annual gala, it was a big community event, you know, 300, 400 people. We'd always have a couple of the scholars speak and we'd ask them to tell their story of how basically how they were raised in poverty and the, by, what, and what they, how their life has changed since they've, you know, gone to college um, and some had already graduated, some are in college. You know, by inference, this organization, this wonderful organization, you know, is, is why I'm here today, a college graduate or on the verge of being a college graduate. And then there'd be, you know, an auction stuff to raise more money for the foundation, right? And so that was kind of the model. For, and that's for a lot of nonprofits in the United States, not, not you know, that we're working with basically run by white people um, serving um, communities of colors. Um, so that was, I was kind of, you know, the, the typical um, modus operandi. And so, um, and we would, um, and then the, the, we started getting some pushback on the board from the staff and this, you know, and other board and board members of color. Well, you know, you're making the kids do the poverty walk. You're pimping them out by having them tell their story of how they were, um, you know, their um, the trauma they experienced growing up in a low income, you know, neighborhood or what they did, kind of a deficit now, you know, a deficit model instead of an asset model of them as a human being. And they and there was this resistance. And, I, and my thinking was, God, we've raised a lot of money every year. And the more money we could raise, the more, you know, and if, if we need to pull on some heartstrings by telling these, you know, dramatic stories, we should just keep doing that. And um, and there was, um, and, and now that has changed for not only for that organization, um, um, but I, I, you know, for many nonprofits nationwide, they've totally reexamined how they um, tell the stories of these um, of the um, people communities they serve, um, and so you know, I, it took a lot of conversation with Josh and other other people, but largely Josh. Um, and this we we're only talking three years ago that this was um, for me to under kind of understand that and get my head around it. Um, Josh, is there anything you want to add about that? Is that Sound about right? Yeah, I mean that that sounds about right. You know, I think Jim, you look in places where, you know, how are you balancing? You're doing good. You know, we, I always tell my mom, and I, you know, sometimes as a black person, we often think, and you know, I say this is that, you know, you go into liberal cities, and sometimes the most liberal cities as a black person is the most dangerous city because liberalism somehow can hide the microaggressions and racism through their willingness to have increased taxes or somehow provide for social programs. However, the policies sometimes are impactful, right? You're thinking through redlining, you're through places in Berkeley or funding and what's been cut. We're thinking of places where Boston, for Black experience for Boston, which is literally such a liberal hub on the East Coast, yet Black people have so much racism, history racism that take place in these liberal places. Or walking down the street being called the police on because you're Black. And we've seen this in 
you know, these apps and now you can make yourself aware of what's happening in your neighborhood. And then all of a sudden you say, Hey, come to my house. I have apples on the front door on the, on the, on the, on, on the you know, steps. And now all of a sudden they call the police the black person. These are true. And so I think my mom represents that, but always as a black person gives the eye of what liberalism look like compared to, we know, uh, a conservative would tell you, and not maybe all conservatives, but people in the South that we think racism is only a Southern thing, they would very much bluntly tell you they don't like you and in your face, at least you can accept that, where you can blindly walk into spaces and they tell you you're accepted, but then they say things like, oh, you're, you're articulate for, 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 for yourself or for, 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 for being black, or you're doing these certain things in cold words, which to me is really just the undertone of racism. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, it's not like I thought I was enlightened because of my, you know, relationship with Josh over the years, but I, you know, or, but maybe I did. And, you know, thought that because I lived in Berkeley, this liberal bastion of progressivism, where we raised a lot of money for kids who could go to college, you know, whatever it was. And then I, and I had this son, Josh, who was black, you know, um, I, I, you know, maybe I thought, before George Floyd kind of opened our eyes that I deserved a free pass on all this stuff because I was trying as hard as I can and doing the best I could what I had, what I knew. But, you know, it doesn't make me less culpable or less responsible for growing more and recognizing that it's a, it's a never ending process in education. And um, I feel privileged to go through that process and have someone, um, you know, have Josh to help me. And and I would say this, you know, and one thing is I think I'm I'm harder on my mother because my I I've never been for why one why second, are you hard on me no. right I am hard on you because I am a I am I am I hold my mother accountable because I have never been a kid when we talked about race when I've been able to articulate and read the books I've read to have a conversation with my mother with the accusation there's nothing like having a conversation around race has been something that we keep in the closet. We've always had conversations. The moment I went to Howard, we have those conversations. And whether it's something my mom may say or, or I may think, we have the opinion. And, 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 and why often, if you see my mother's growth, but then also continue to hold, because we talk about, Jim, the second podcast, we talk about trauma. And we talk about, we can't talk about my trauma in my formative years and all of a sudden now I'm 40, I should be over it. Because trauma lasts for a long time and how you overcome it. Right. So that, I think that's the first thing. And so the expectation of my mother would be like, hey, now I have a black son. I should get over it 20 years. Like we have to, <laughs> that's going to take a long time. However, I've been a kid who's often want to, as my mother, hold me accountable. And I, I'm good to my point. For so long from college up until 30, my parents, every time the night before I would leave to go back to D.C., my parents were like, hey, we want to talk to you. Great. We don't want to talk to him. Well, you know, it's, you said you said this, or your behavior is this. And we want to make sure this is something that's not embedded in you. Every time I would come home, my parents would have an accountability conversation with me. They would see something wrong I said or some behavior I've done, and that was great. And so, why can I then have that same accountability with my mother, and vice versa for us as we grow, as I grow as an adult? Now, my mother probably still think I'm 18, but at this point, still having that. And I think that's what's really important, having those conversations. And lastly, I was on a t I was on a game show. I mean, I was on a dating show, and I was probably going to my junior junior year of high school, junior college, excuse me. And I remember I was my I was uh, I was took a fashion class. So we went to New York for the day, and I was walking with a friend. And this person came up. This woman came up to us and said, "Hey." Are you guys dating? I'm like, no, this is my friend. She's like, well, forget it. You want to pretend as if you're like boyfriend and girlfriend to get on this dating show. And I'm like, sure, why not? So we got on the show, it aired, and a day later, my mother writes this whole paragraph, like a paragraph, like a page and a half of how she felt like I did the black community disservice because I wanted to perpetuate the stereotypes of black people that happen to me. And you know, for me, not thinking about that and only coming to a point where I'm just thinking this is shits and giggles and it's fun and everyone else thinks it's fun, but having to think about what's been portrayed and my mother thinking that. And so those are just always those steps where we talk about race and challenging each other. It's challenging in love. And, and um, you know, I should say this, you know, um, my father has taught me to, because he's this way, is to uh, be 
be quick to listen and, and, and slow to speak. And my father is very much like that. He only starts talking when I'm making martinis, but, uh, but in all honesty, he leads that way. And I try to as well. Uh, to both of you, what can we do um, to help out, um, you know, the Joshes, the sixth grade Joshes out there um, in the world? Um, should we all be offering to mentor um, or be engaged? Jackie, I know you're still engaged in many more ways than you've already mentioned. Um, but to both of you, what, 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 what more or what can we, um, can, what can each individual listening um, do? I mean, it's different for everybody, you know, and I, I'm not going to say give money to this, you know, or, you know, go out and become a mentor for uh, the local boys and girls club, is, but that stuff is all important too, but it's do what you can do, but learn and be open. I think, you know, we're so polarized right now on so many levels and it's, it's hard to, it's harder than it used to be, I believe, to hear someone else's point of view. And I mean, someone on the political spectrum or it could be someone from a different race or culture, but it's just to um, be open to other people's experiences as valid. Um, and give and, uh, back in some way that fits for you. Well, if you do that, if, yeah, if you're open to other people's experiences and, you you know, it'll be, or it'll come to you how best to um, kind of parlay what you've um, mm -hmm. taken in to, um, you know, make the world a better place. Yeah, no, I think that's well said. Josh? I, I, yeah, I think to echo that, you know, people say, wow, this story you have is great. I mean, there's, uh, I'm very fortunate, you know, and because the life um, I grew up and live and live in the survivor mode, but I think um, somehow, somehow that person can be open, you know, um, you, you can't tell a kid uh, who grew up in an environment, environment of violence, um, of never having support. And now the, it has changed with parenting because the parents are my age, raising 15, 16 year olds or even younger to have that. Um, but if you find someone who's willing to be supportive of you, and, and it's easier said than done to open up because it took me a long time when we deal with abandonment issues to be vulnerable and still try to lead with that because I try to lead with vulnerability even with my team and still working on it. But if you can um, to find someone to be open who wants to, who like wants to support you, who believes in you, then, then do that. But it's not just beyond the 11 year old, it's those who are still older, who still struggle to find that community, who still struggle to find someone who loves them, to, be, to feel accepted, uh, accepted to where you feel like you're just alone, you're just trying to survive. Because even this day, I still deal with some of the survival issues and don't ask my parents for help or try to figure things out because at times I've always just tried to figure things out. You know? Um, and so we have to just lead with love you know, I think, and and um, and um, and understanding that our backgrounds are different, but yes, somewhat similar, and find the similarities. And I think it goes back to what my mom had mentioned. That's good. And so, yeah. Well, Josh, as I've said before, um, I'm going to say it again. I think you should start your own podcast. <laughs> I, I think you will quickly become. Uh, uh, I think you'll have a very popular podcast. You have, you have so many different um, uh, facets, and um, uh, I just think it would be uh, you're a natural. And now I, you know, and now I know uh, uh, where a lot of it comes from. Having met Jackie. Um, <laughs> well, 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 you know, the many days, you know, I always, you know, I I always say this, and even I think about this when I think about working in the you know, uh, my ability to adapt to every situation because of my family and being able to relate to that, you know, it's just like, oh, in Judaism, relate to this, and oh, you're black or you're poor. I always say, you know, I live in, live in America with two different halves. My experience growing up was poor and my in upper middle class white experience. I don't know what a middle class black experience is. And still to this day, we live in two different Americas where there are two different experiences. So me going to Martha's Vineyard two week, two years ago of like a black week and now having to understand the history of Oak Bluff, that's great, but then I still don't get it because I grew up so differently. I grew up six days before, one one day this and then, and all of a sudden that went from like 
with a drop of a dime of drinking whole milk to like we do we 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 you know we do one percent we do eat this we do my mother came even we were talking about times i remember my mom that came to me came to to came to dc back in 2009 by graduation my mother really just went through my cabinets and said you can't have this you can't have this you can't have this <laughs> Right, because we went to Trader Joe's and we went, you know, looked at ingredients on the shelf and how to, how to read a nutritional um, chart on the back of a box <laughs> of cereal or whatever. For right, because how yeah. do you know that when you when you grew up in a place where you you had, uh, you know, you you there was there was no uh, a, a grocery store, a food desert. You had the closest thing was a mile away to the market. We didn't have a car. You know, these are real issues that you deal with. Um, and so just because all of a sudden now you currently live with someone for eight months, do you think all of a sudden now your habits change to what you know, because you still feel like you're poor? Now he well, eats healthier than we do. Now he does. Yeah. And apparently he makes a mean martini. Unless, wow. when, if my, unless, unless when I go out, because I tell you the one thing is I love to cook at home. But my mother, from the day I was young, would go to a nice restaurant. So it's really her fault. That's my money. There, yeah, that's how it is my fault. All my fault. Yeah. Uh, it, 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 it always is. Always, always blame the mom. Exactly. It's, always, it's always mom's fault. Yep, it comes back to that. Well, Jackie and Josh, it has been great to have you on. Um, I really enjoyed this. I feel like we just got to the tip of the iceberg, but um, uh, it has really been, Jackie, it was uh, really nice to meet you after hearing about uh, so much about you and to see the interaction between the two of you. Um, really wonderful. And again, Josh, when you're ready to start your podcast, we will help set you up, <laughs> teach you all the little tricks. Uh, yeah. But thank you for... Trip. But thank you both uh, for coming on. It's just been wonderful. Our pleasure. It was fun. And for our listeners out there, remember you can follow us on in Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. And you can sign up for our email at our website at thepoliticallife.net. And uh, we hope you all have a great week. And we'll see you next Friday. Mm -hmm.